Good morning. Good morning. Pray with me, please. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts and minds of your people, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm so pleased to be with you on All Saints Sunday. Uh, you know, All Saints Day was normally November, or it is November 1st. Um, and then we, but Sunday, we have the option of celebrating it with the, the fuller and larger body on that. As we remember this remarkable cloud of witnesses of saints throughout the ages who helped carry and spread the Christian faith. All Souls Day is the next day, November 2nd, uh, the day after All Saints Day, and it celebrates ordinary people who live faithful, saintly lives who have gone before us but are not, not widely known or recognized. Our spiritual lives are enriched when we learn the stories of these saints. We are people of story. We are people of story, God's story. And these saints give us examples of courage and humility and perseverance and faithfulness, come what may. And many, but not all, were just ordinary people who served a humble and humble and powerful ways, an extraordinary God. This morning, my message is one about story, God's story, and how his story shapes our story as messengers of God's story and how we engage the stories of others. I wanted to start by sharing with you um, the opening lines of a poem it's a classic poem that was published in 1906 by Alfred Noyes, and a few people in the room will recognize it. One of the most popular and successful uh, writers of his era. And when I was young, my mother would uh, I'd sit in her lap and she'd rock me and she'd read to me just every night. And I just always loved this poem and I kept begging her to read it to me again and again. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor. And the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding up to the old end door. To this day, it brings vivid images to my mind, the rhythm of the words, the flow of the storyline, the intensity of the sacrifice of the landlord's black-eyed daughter, a daughter, Bess, and the tragic ending of the highwayman. And this memory is a part of my story. Now, I'm not recommending that you begin reading this to your children. It's quite a violent story, and it's, um, I guess we were a little tougher back then or something, I don't know. But as a child, I was drawn to the story by the passion and the nobility of his efforts to set all things right in this colonial setting, and that's the power of story. We're shaped and formed by stories, hundreds, maybe thousands of stories. And in all reality, we are shaped by both the good stories and the not so good stories in our lives. But regardless of the generation and the language and the culture and the era and the, the epic that they're in, the context, we are people of story. That's how God has made us. And we learn from the stories of those passed down to us. The oral traditions and pre-literate societies are masterful in recounting and retelling stories of the past and communicating social values for future generations. And individual stories make up these narratives in our own lives. In the Anglican Church, we do this in many different ways. We do this using colors and seasons and symbols as expressions of sacramental realities. Because again, we're a very ancient church, and as we were developing, it was in a very it was in a preliterate world. And so we're communicating the gospel in everything we do, especially the Eucharist, where we're telling the full creation uh, story uh, of the gospel. These are all parts of God of God's story and communicating it. So we talk about the biblical narrative as a single narrative of the Bible. In the beginning. In Genesis, which a word actually means beginnings, in the beginning in Genesis, it's the opening line of creation, a good creation. In the beginning, 
beginning of John's gospel, the opening line is about incarnation, redemption, and restoration of creation as seen in our Revelation passage that was read uh, today. It's a single narrative, a drama of creation, separation, redemption, and restoration. And that is the narrative of God's story in our lives. And we've lived that out as image bearers of the Most High God. In the Old Testament, after years of struggle, infighting, laws, rebellion, when life seemed so dark and hopeless, in an amazing plot twist, our Redeemer, our Messiah, was born in a manger. And through his life, death, and resurrection, ascension, he sends the Holy Spirit, and we emerge as people of hope with the promise of a future restored by Jesus when he returns. John 3, 16 sums it up so well, and that's one of the reasons it's the most popular verse that people have. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the biblical narrative. Everything the world is longing for, our neighbors, our friends, the people we work with, everything they're longing for, we have. We have hope. We are people of hope. We have redemption of broken relationships. We have purpose and meaning to our lives. Now, some may be uncomfortable with me using the word story related to the Bible, but we then tend to think of stories as being fictional. But this is clearly not the case in Scripture there's parables and there's poems and there's allegorical images. So you, ha you have to read the scripture, recognizing what kind of literature that you're reading in at that particular time. But these are just stories within the grand narrative of God's story, which has no mixture of error. The evidence is all around us. This is God's story. Creation, separation, redemption, and restoration. In today's gospel, we get a snapshot of much of a bigger section of scripture in Matthew uh, as a Sermon on the Mount and in Luke as a Sermon on the Level Place. Now, one of the things that really helped me in reading that is, you know, we're capturing a sermon, um, but it's also, remember Jesus had three years of telling sermons repeated all day, all around that area with that. And John uh, in his gospel at the end confirms that and said, if, if we wrote down all the things that Jesus did and said, all the books in the world wouldn't contain it. So when I read the, the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, which is Luke's um, version and, and, and uh, Matthew's version on it, I recognize that each of those topics is probably a summary of a much deeper, longer sermon that Jesus gave. And so they're capturing it and it's accurate but I just wonder, wow, wouldn't it be something to be able to hear the rest of, the, of each of those sermons as Jesus was unpacking those things? And I think that's a very reasonable thing to conclude um, in looking at it. So in Luke 6, as Jesus lifted up his eyes on the disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leave for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Wow. He really turns this thing upside down, doesn't he? We don't even really have a word that captures that, that original word that Jesus used about blessed, we, that's why some translation says happy, which happy tends to be a little t more temporary and based on our circumstances, but blessed is based on, on our God who is with us. So that, that's a translation that has great meaning in terms of, of just even that word. But woe to you who are rich and for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, and you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, as so they did to their fathers. Now again, the word woe here is not 
pointing your finger at somebody and say, aha, God's gonna get you. It's, it's woven into a, this breaks my heart for you who are depending on your money and, and it breaks my heart for you, woe for you. It's just, it's woeful to me that those that are, are depending on these things, uh, their food and their abundance and ignoring the people who are being, who are blessed, who are being drawn to God. In a culture of world of honor and shame, blessings and curses, Jesus makes this point clearly. The things that we seek in this world, money and power and pleasure and popularity, are not necessarily the things that will bring you true and everlasting joy. They're not necessarily evil in and of themselves, but they're not an adequate substitute for the satisfaction and the laughter and the joy and the community that's found in the kingdom of God. For me, and I really mean this, <clears throat> and your experience may be different, but I wouldn't trade the best day of my life before following Jesus for the worst day of my life since. I really wouldn't. And like you, I've had some terrible days and I've had some terrible months and I've had some terrible years and I know I will have more in, in my lifetime. But the difference now is that when I face tragedy, even death, I know that I do not have to face it alone. It was that loneliness and that emptiness that was so much, so painful in, in the years before I knew that God created me and he understands my separation and redeemed me through the blood of Jesus Christ and has given me a hope. We are people of hope. and We need to never forget that. So what Jesus is doing here is he's teaching us how to live out God's story in our lives. He's teaching our stories to become one that reflect him and much better. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other also. For one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wished for others to do to you, so do to them. Again, it's in the theme of saying, these possessions, these things we hold so important, Let's not get too upset when they slip out of our fingers and, and out of our hands. You know, let's, let's honor God and take care of the things that we're entrusted with, but let's not turn them into idols. So now we've talked about God's story and how it impacts your story and my story as followers of Jesus. And how do we know that God's story is shaping us? How do we know that we know God's story we know our story. How do we know and see that God's story is shaping us? Well, there's a, a really shortcut way to find this. And one is the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. What a precious gift for the world. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, if I experience in those fruit, that fruit being exhibited in, in my life, then that's a good sense that God's story is really shaping me more and more um, in the image of Jesus. And against these things, there is no law. Am I abiding in Christ? Is it reflected in our interactions? Are we being merciful, forgiving? Are we people living as people of hope. Now, when we share our own story with other people, they are becoming aware of God's story because it has formed us. And so when you are sharing who you are and about your story, it's, it's really an important concept. It's not a technique. It's not a, a evangelism tool. It's simply being honest about what you've seen, what you've learned, and what you've personally experienced. It doesn't need to be judgmental, doesn't need to be argumentative. It just needs to be honest of what you've experienced. And it doesn't need to be exaggerated. It just needs to be what it is because that's your story and God's story is a part of your story. And so by default, they are 
hearing how God has impacted your life. As you can see from today's gospel, the people Jesus challenged were generally the, the religious people who obsessed on appearances, not the down and outers and, and the loss and hurting. He's calling them blessed and, and raising them up. And he confronts us to let go of those things that become barriers between us and God, that become barriers between us and others, and really become barriers between us and our own um, satisfaction and, and purpose in life. We're simply called to be honest. A couple of weeks ago, Kathy and I were in Boston, first time we had visited there, and we traveled to take a short vacation after all the activities that led up to her ordination. So we didn't rent a car, we used public transit. It was just fabulous, fabulous time. And Boston's really uh, got a great public transportation system. But going to the airport, we needed to take an Uber. So we took an Uber to the airport and their driver turned out to be from Nigeria, um, where there are over 18 million Anglicans. Almost half the Anglicans in the world live in Nigeria. So I figured he probably had heard of the Anglican church and had some experience. We responded that, that He's an inactive Catholic, but firmly believed that all religious experience is designed to make people docile and, and compliant. And he believed that all religion was bad and the cause of most of the problems in the world. And he got more and more intense in this. Now, I understood that that was in some ways part of the culture, part of the culture of, the, of where we were, but also uh, part of just a high context culture that, that their words are said in ways that match what they're saying. And, and that's um, really very different in other cultures. He didn't believe there's anything beyond this life that we all died and we just went into the ground. Now he told us that he came to the US as a teenager and he was a few years older than I am. Um, and it made me think and it reminded me while I was in the, the Uber, it reminded me of a, a student in seminary that was in my, one of my classes who was from Nigeria. And I'd noticed a scar on his hand and asked him about that. And he said, we well, had a civil war in Nigeria um, a few years before that. And I think, I thought at the time, it's somewhere in the 60s and 70s. I didn't ask the Uber driver about this, um, but it, really, it crossed my mind. So later I looked it up. It was a two and a half civil war in the late 1960s 67 to, to the January of 70, uh, that was probably about the time when he immigrated to the US as a teenager. So I suspect this is a significant part of his story and of his pain and his hurt. And you never know the, the hurt another person carries. So Kathy and I listened and we, you know, nodded in agreement we're hearing and, and yeah, there, there are lots of bad things that have been done in the name of religion, even in the name of Christianity. Um, and his intensity, again, was not something to be taken personally. It was something that, um, that really showed was part of his story in terms of, of the impact of his life. So after a few minutes of silence, you know, we're writing and I asked him, you know, I wonder if there's, if you see any difference between someone who is religious and someone who is following Jesus. And he repeated the question out loud and he thought briefly and then said intensely, no, there's absolutely no difference between being religious and following Jesus because you have to be committed to a church if you follow Jesus and that makes you religious. And I said, yeah, you know, maybe so. I said, but I know for me, when I decided to follow Jesus, it had nothing to do with church or denomination. I just knew I needed some hope and some purpose. And I was just being honest on that. Well, he got really quiet and we rode on and like he was uncertain how to respond. And I said, well, it just seems to me there are people who use religion for selfish reasons and others who follow Jesus and want to help people. There are good churches and that do good things. And I said, in fact, you know, I, I buy a coffee from a Rwanda for a ministry, um, an Anglican ministry, who brings together the Hutu and the Tutsi for reconciliation and building friendships. He seemed kind of surprised that I knew 
this much about African nations. And, you know, and it, I said, it's one of the, you know, I didn't say to him, but it's one of the benefits of being an Anglican and being part of a missional global church. Most ain't that, uh, Anglicans live in Africa. And so there's a real shift to, to the African church and leading us, if you've been following any of that with GAFCON and the meetings and the most recent uh, conversation. So by nature, I am an introvert. I'm a highly relational introvert, but it, it always exhausts me. And so this is not an, a technique. I'm not trying to trick him into anything. It's just a conversation between two human beings and, and going through life, an Uber driver. We shared some perspectives on this short ride. Kathy and I shared um, some of our life experiences and, and about what we'd read and learned and personally experienced with Jesus. And, and our story is that, and it does reflect the grace and truth of God. And this is always best shared through simple human kindness and respect. You just never know what burden another is carrying. So I pray that this Uber driver is pawning. I prayed for him several times since what it really means to follow Jesus. And most importantly, he too is a person with a story, a life narrative. He was born an image bearer of God, just like, like any of us, all of us, whether he realizes it or not. As followers of Jesus, our stories are intertwined with God's story. So when we interact with others, when we do simple things in our life with our neighbors or with people that are serving us in a restaurant where we're just simply kind, they're actually getting glimpses of God's story because that's not our, our normal nature. That has come because of God's story in our lives. And as the old saying goes, we may be the only Bible they ever download. So at this point, um, I wanna go back to what I said at the beginning. God's story, how his story shapes our story, and as messengers of God's story, how we engage with the stories of others. We honor the saints who have been part of that narrative, and part of that story, grateful for how they ushered us through 2,000 years of history, and now we share our stories and honor the stories of others. You know, one thing at this uh, synod that we were just at, they, they reminded us to do is, you know, to ask the question, have you personally said yes to Jesus? Are there more things you need to say yes to Jesus about in your life to better reflect God's story in your life? Um, this is a great church for saying yes to Jesus and understanding what that means and then being discipled and, and, and taught and mentored in these different ways. And do you have somebody in your life who hasn't said yes to Jesus that you just need to give them that opportunity? And it's as simple as that because it's God who's been pursuing us. All we're doing is taking the time to turn around and notice and say yes. And he's giving us the same call he gave to the apostles who were the first saints that we honor. Uh, come, follow me and it will turn your world upside down. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you don't yet know him, get to know him, and he will change your life eternally. Come and see. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever, amen.